It's really great when uh, you've seen the ecosystem grow, whereby we had uh, people, most of the developers were hired by governmental institutions, and the ambition was uh, really mostly working for a non-profit or a government institution. Then there is a boom into the private sector locally. Then after that, now there is a boom into international organizations or companies coming in Rwanda, hiring the talent. So when you see this kind of growth, you are like, really there is no limit to what people can do, no matter where they are based. Uh, or their locality is. Welcome to Melia Cred, Conversations with Elvis. I'm Elvis Melia. At Melia Cred, we provide consultancy and research for economic development. And in these conversations, I seek to understand a bit better what the internet is doing on the ground in Africa to help young workers gain access to global labor markets, not just being price competitive, but entering into careers that are meaningful and what avenues are opening up for workers that can help them fulfill their dreams and help them work in areas that were hitherto closed off or meant traveling to live in far off countries. Can the internet provide that flat world, that death of distance? Or is this still an elusive idea by pundits like myself? Or is it something that's actually happening in some areas more than others? And that's what I'm trying to explore. Where is the internet creating avenues for work for workers in the global south? And in this light, I'm currently in a cluster of conversations from Kigali. We spoke in our first conversations with various training providers and ecosystem players, and then moved on to the companies themselves. Global business services companies that came to Kigali to see whether or not services can be exported from Kigali as a delivery location. I had a conversation with Gary Bennett of Tech Experts and a conversation with Godfrey Svenjika of Deriv, an online brokerage firm. That was our last conversation. And in this conversation, I'm speaking with Jacques Nilinkindi of Objectivity, which is the one of the more recent entries into the Kigali uh, services exports sector. I hope you enjoy the conversation with Jacques as much as I did. Here is Jacques Nilinkindi. Jacques. Yes. Thanks for doing this. You're welcome. So we met, when did we meet? A couple days ago? Yes, I think three days ago three maybe. Days ago. <laughs> yeah, right. And yeah. You're, we're at Norskin here, mm -hmm. co-working space. Yes, yes. Is that what it's called? Is it called a co-working space or is it, uh, is it a tech hub? or? Uh, it's uh, more of a co-working space because uh, they don't just limit on technology. Even other companies that are into different, I would say, things like law farms and others are really free to come and take their space right. uh, in here. And it's quite new, right? The space has been built. Have you been here from the start or did you just...? Uh, no, we've been here for, I think, now two months, two months uh, yeah. the company. But I knew the space uh, before because the space has been here. I think now it's maybe the second year. Mm -hmm. So it's still quite new. It's in the process. I mean, we were here in March. We had a conference here in March mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was, uh, yeah, the, there was a lot of construction going on yes. still. So, yes, so yes. yeah, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, um, so who are you? Who's your company? What do you do? Uh, yes, I am Jacques. Uh, Jacques, I'm the head of software development in a company called Objectivity. Uh, Objectivity is a software development company, uh, a British company, with uh, offices uh, across Europe and uh, now moving to Africa uh, in what we call Objectivity 2.0. And one of the objectives of that was uh, creating or moving or growing our kind of talent pool. We have uh, an office in Mauritius, uh, and now we also have a new office here in Kigali, whereby we want to hire as many talent as we can to kind of contribute to the already market and tools we have um, from the UK and Germany and also other European markets. Uh, our goal is mainly not only hiring, but also impacting the local market by providing skills, upskilling, but also looking into how we can contribute to the education sector, for example. Uh, by the education sector, I mean, how do you impact uh, things that are being thought maybe by partnering with the university so that people that get out of 
uh, a specific course they are market ready. How do you uh, provide some of the experience we've gathered over a period of time, not only into software development, but also maybe sales, if there are uh, entrepreneurs there, how can we kind of pr plug in and tell them, you know, try to do this, try to do that, providing guidance. So we are a software development company, but also that would like to make an uh, impact in whichever country we step in, in a way. Okay, and how many employees do you, does Objectivity have? Uh, we are about to hit a thousand uh, employees, uh, before, hopefully by the end of this year. Uh, in Rwanda specifically, uh, we are now five empl employees. Uh, we are hoping to be 60 by uh, the end of uh, the year, and if everything goes well, 500 uh, in five years. Okay, mm. okay. And you personally, you used to work with Andela. Yes, right, yes. in the past. So Andela was this, still is, I mean, mm. it's an interesting company. Uh, yeah. The Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, um, <clears throat> there was a lot of Omidyar, there was a lot of funding behind it uh, yes. in, in, in Nigeria first, right, then uh, going into Kenya and, and Rwanda and some other countries, right? Yes, yes. And the idea that it's, I think it's the slogan on the wall that it's, uh, talent is distributed equally and opportunity is not. Yes, like yes. The idea that software development at a very high level mm -hmm. can happen from what is perceived to be a remote location and what you know people like us are trying to say is mm -hmm. actually not a remote location. Yes, it's yes, just yes, yes, you, may, yes. you may not have been there yet. Yes, yes. Um, so, so how does that trajectory, you're, you're, you're really part of that, I would say, as a non-technical person, the high-end coding ecosystem mm -hmm. in Kigali, right? Mm. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, if I were to speak a little bit about the talent pool, uh, when you look at it uh, globally, uh, some things don't have to be focused on location. When you look at things like engineering, what people are doing in the US can be done anywhere in the world. It's the same thing that people are doing in China, in India, why can't it be done in Africa, specifically in Rwanda, in the East African region of, uh, of this continent, in a way. Uh, when you think about talent, you can't limit people by opportunities by the location where people are born or where they stay. Because no matter where you are, you can contribute to the world, I would say, development. What really matters is becoming what I would call a world-class engineer or developer. Now, how do we create a career path? whereby one, whether they were born in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa or they were born in any developed country, have the same opportunities as long as they have the skills and how do we develop the skills. That's where all these companies come in. There is Andela, there is Objectivity. There are really many companies that are starting uh, in Rwanda specifically. I know a couple of them. Whereby you find that they get, I would say, jobs in the western region or in the western part of the world, but then talents, they are built by the talent in Rwanda, specifically, or in other East African countries. And we have a lot of products that have been built that are being used by millions of users, by Africans. I mean, by global citizens, but they were built by Africans. Now, how do we put these people on the map? How do we create a good and quality talent pool that is also trustworthy? And it's been done by companies, and it's the same thing we're trying to do also with objectivity in a way. Right. So how do you, having been in this ecosystem in, in Kigali with mm -hmm. other coders and, you know, having seen trajectories over the last few years yeah. of where the cluster of IT developers came from mm -hmm. and where it has developed to, do you feel that, so we have these extreme points on the spectrum. Some people say that... Uh, online is hype, <laughs> yes. everything is done in person. Mm -hmm. uh, look at Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. they are the ones providing the online space, yet they cluster very tightly in offices nearby each other. Yes, Some yes. of them even say, even if you're as far away as San Francisco, you're already out of the picture. You need to be in Palo Alto, yeah. you need to be right there to meet in person, which is kind of ironic because they're mm. the ones developing the digital space, right? Yeah. Then there's the other end of the spectrum, which is this narrative of the flat world, right? The yes. idea that 
you could, you could, if you have an internet connection and you're brilliant, you can work from your village, mm -hmm. and you never even need to have a mentor who physically teaches you because you can just watch YouTube videos, right? I think neither of those are true, <laughs> right? Those are the extreme points. But where is the world in between? Like, where do you see the world? Because obviously, clustering and face to face is important. Mm -hmm in the hub, mm -hmm. but it doesn't necessarily need to be Silicon Valley. It can also be Kigali or Nairobi or Lagos, right? Yes, it doesn't. And when, when you even focus on a specific city like Kigali, it doesn't have to be that all of you are in the same room, in the same office. It's, not, it's more than it being a location and also being where you are working or where you are seated. Uh, countries are huge. When you look at uh, Rwanda, I might be in Kigali, the capital city, right? Doing some work in any tech farm, contributing. But someone might be in a remote place, in a village somewhere, as long as they are connected and still deliver and have good products delivered in their, I would say, company. Uh, and when you think about it, it's, it's, less of, uh, it's, it's less of the location, locality, and more of the will and uh, delivery at some point. Uh, people are in the US, right? They've built, the ecosystem has been built there. I would say the tech ecosystem, we have the Silicon Valley there. But haven't they been outsourcing in India before for the past couple of years? So if products have been built in India, delivered in the US, why can't they switch into different locations, not only just India, but also yeah. other countries? Because it's something that has been happening. When you look at uh, the call centers boom, yeah, mostly all call centers operate in India. <laughs> right. So not only in India, yeah. but in very particular cities. Yes. Right. They're also clustered. That's what I'm thinking. It's it's it's. I think the internet is helping spread opportunity, mm -hmm. but not like a blanket slate. Yeah. They're spreading it like dots. It goes from Silicon Valley to Bangalore, but, uh, right, to Manila, uh -huh. to Kigali. Yes. So that's why I want to push back on your notion a little bit of if you're in a village outside of Kigali, I would think the distance between a village in Kigali, uh -huh. a village in Rwanda, uh -huh. say two hours away from Kigali, uh -huh. the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the clustering distance uh -huh. is further between Kigali, which is a hub, yes, yes. and the village, which is the periphery, uh -huh. It's, that distance is bigger than yes. the actual distance between Kigali and Silicon Valley Silicon because Valley. you already have a cluster of knowledge workers here who can support each other, right? So it's, how do you feel? Yeah, I, and I really, and I totally agree with you because uh, when there is development in a city, when you look at development and people uh, migrating or people's migration, people migrate to cities for opportunities, right? And whenever there is an employer, sometimes they tell you you have to be in the main city. So this might limit the person staying in a certain uh, village somewhere, right? right? But then comes a concept of remote work right. or work from home. So this is something that has been really, I would say, uh, has been operational with the COVID pandemic coming in, whereby people now are moving into the countryside homes as long as they are connected and they were delivering some work, right? Uh, then when you look at it on a more, I would say, large scale, it's less of your locality and more of the development in places where you are. Because places are limited by the kind of resources they need to make sure they can get the opportunities. Resources might be institutions in terms of education, resources might be in terms of connectivity. So if someone doesn't have good internet connection, they are they won't be they accessing these uh, kind of opportunities that are up there. And when you look at the hiring process that has been also going on, it's not, people no longer need to be employed by one company. Someone can go online, have a gig at Upwork, and still make on the side. Good, yeah. But isn't that, aren't that also people that already know the trade? So I'm wondering, someone like you, mm -hmm. you've been in this industry for how long now? Uh, around now, 10 years. 10 years. Yes. So, the Jacques of today mm -hmm. could move to the village yes. and work from there online. As long as the internet is there, mm -hmm. you know what you need to do. Yes, yes. The Jacques of 10 years ago might have needed to come to Kigali to learn from yes. the mentors, right? So yes, if we're yes. looking at, so there's two different 
kind of demographies that we're looking at, right? <laughs> yes, yes. The, yes. the masters of the trade. Mm -hmm. And kind of the learners or beginners. And the learners and beginners. I'm still thinking the one is online work for the masters is fine, mm -hmm. but for the learners and beginners, I would imagine is still important for them to group up, right? To have yes. these kinds of hubs. Yes. Doesn't only need to be in Kigali, maybe can be in Giseni also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm a bit skeptical about the village. Like somebody, maybe somebody is a genius in a village and they can teach themselves, but yes, most yes, people yeah. need help, right? I know that I need help from when I start out in something new. Mm -hmm. They need to, I need some, there's something You need a different. community. You need yeah. a community. So a community is something that uh, really helps people in their careers. When you are with a group of people, not just, I would say, with the same goals, but with the same ambition, it helps you a lot in your career growth. Uh, when I speak specifically for software development, uh, you can't start a career while working remotely, and uh, it's really hard for you to be really successful or have a good, I would say, scalable growth and a quick growth as compared to you being in an office somewhere with a group or with a group of people. The reason being that you might, find, you might have a blocker at some point uh, while coding, right? Then you go online, you Google it. Yes, there are a lot of resources, but then there is this kind of human interaction that is needed because the resources you get are really specific even if the issue is resolved, it just tells you, you have to do this, right? But then no one is there to explain to you, maybe you have to do this because of this, then this would lead to this. Next time, if, if you want to avoid it, do it this way, right? So there are a lot of limited, I would say, resources on the internet compared to having a community around you whereby you meet people, you ask questions, you learn from each other, then you grow together. Uh, in my, I would say, career path, our communities have, have played a really huge role because having friends that you can jump on, let me call them friends, but they might also not be friends, but having people that with the same ambitions that I can just write to a message and tell them I have this, would you maybe mind joining me in this hackathon and let's try it out. These are the things that make you grow, while when you are in a remote place, in a village somewhere without a support system, if I may call it like that, it would really, really be hard. Yes, you can deliver, you can grow, but you would miss out on some part of it, like human interactions. And uh, let's not forget that as much as you are good technically, it doesn't assure you that uh, you will always get jobs. Because sometimes jobs uh, depend on recommendations and meeting with people, people right. knowing you, and all right. these kind of things. Yeah. So even now as an established coder, as an established programmer, mm -hmm. I heard programmers don't like to be called coders because it's <laughs> derogatory. Uh, yeah, 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 and yeah. don't call them also ITs, we are not ITs. So. <laughs> <laughs> IT help desk, no, you're programmers. Yeah. Yes, so as an established programmer mm -hmm. working for a global company, mm -hmm. um, even though you're this established, you still chose to come to this hub. Yes. Um, to also have these connections, right? I yes. would assume, and to meet people from other fi adjacent fields, right? Yes, yes. Uh, not only meet people from uh, different fields, but also have a sense of, I would say, community whereby you get out, meet with someone from a different, I would say, part of the world, from a different sector. Here we have people that are lawyers, we have people that are into fintech, we have people that are into, I would say, agriculture, people that are into funding, so VCs. Yes, some of these skills, you need them uh, not only as a company, but as an individual. If you are an entrepreneur, you need to be somewhere whereby you will get different perspectives from people, different market options, different, I would say, uh, if you need to restructure something in your organization, you can't just sit down as one person and just decide because there are different points of views, people see it differently, and learning from each person's, I would say, uh, point of view or experience, this really helps you. That's why as, as a company, really, being in this space helps us a lot. All right. Yeah. And do you um, work, for, do, you, do, do you export services, uh, software development services, or do you work for local companies? The uh, local sector. We don't uh, we don't provide our services. I would say uh, to local companies yet uh, or organizations. Uh, our structure right now is set up to as building a delivery center in Kigali or in Rwanda, whereby we still uh, have developers here, but contributing to tools that uh, 
are from the UK and Germany. Uh, something I didn't say at the start is that most of our sales group or I would say products that we built are mainly for the UK market and uh, for the German market. Now we also have some products we built for the Polish, I would say, market, but uh, those are the main, I would say, huge markets that we have. And in all these countries uh, like Mauritius and Brenda, we are trying now to build delivery centers with developers that are equipped with the right skills and with the right also, I would say, tools so that they can contribute uh, on these other products that serve uh, the global market in a way. So when you say you're trying to get them who have or develop them who have the right skills. Mm -hmm. Are you also working, are you also training or do you outsource that or do you partner with training institutions or what is the connection, for example, with Andela? Uh, uh, is there a connection or? No, there is no connection with uh, Andela. We are totally a uh, separate company. Uh, but we do kind of upskilling. Uh, what we do, we get people with experience. Uh, so experienced software developers already on the market, but then we try to put them through what I would call a requalification program, depending on what the market needs, uh, what we are looking at uh, on the global market that is needed. So if it's a new language, if it's a new uh, stack, if it's, a, I don't know, a new way of working that is out there that we think we need to adapt to so that we can get products, customers, that's what we do. Okay. And how's that going? How, are you finding that talent? Or are you, is, there, is, there, is there a talent shortage or is there a bottleneck? Where would be the bottleneck in your... Uh, there is really a good talent pool of developers here in Rwanda. Uh, what's really uh, missing out is kind of uh, the right experience uh, in a way and also trying to match what's required from our side on uh, uh, requirements in terms of skills and what they are, have as skills. Yes, they are good developers, but sometimes you find that uh, maybe we are looking for a specific language and you can't find the right people with that uh, specific language here. That's when, that's where we decided to be like, yes, you have the right skills, then we look at you, do you, do you have the, are you willing really to learn something new? So if you are willing to learn something new and you're ambitious and uh, we see that really you are a good developer in your previous kind of technology that you've been using, we, we then uh, hire you, but then you go through this requalification whereby we now align you with our kind of market requirements, then you join one of our teams and uh, contribute to customer products. And the team is then a global team? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, 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 yes. And how does, I mean, don't give away your IP, but how does a, a day in your work look like in a global team? And, you're working hybrid-wise, like some of the global teams are sitting in the same locations in some places and some of them are sitting totally by themselves? Totally or? by themselves, yes, 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 yes. And uh, uh, most of our teams really work remote places, mostly from, from their home. Uh, but uh, the way we work is just the normal software development, like any other software development uh, company does. It's the kind of uh, scrum and agile process, whereby we have daily stand-ups, we have weekly retros, we have product managers helping you um, using some kind of, uh, I would say, products in, in terms of communication, emails, teams, or all these kind of other things. As long as people are together in terms of uh, same channels, they have this, they know what they have to deliver. We have good product managers that assign people tasks. We have uh, team leaders that review what people have delivered. We have teams that are into uh, quality assessment, testers, then we have also the global people that are in charge of the development, but also business analysts that align what developers are doing what, with what the customers really need. That's the way we do it in our way. Okay. Yeah. And are you seeing now, you've been 10 years in this industry, mm -hmm. are you seeing, kind of we had in the 1980s, 1990s, this connection between Silicon Valley and Bangalore, mm -hmm. right? And that then spread to other places. Yeah. What are you seeing now in the 2010s, 2020s now? I know pandemic was interesting. I guess it gave it a boost maybe mm -hmm. of, you know, if everybody's working from home anyway, mm -hmm. you might as well find people from some new locations. Yes. How do you see this happening in, in your ecosystem, in your network? In like, how are, how eager are companies to come down here? Is, is this, is there, are they still hesitant or? Uh, companies are really eager to come down here. The only issue that we have is policies by governments. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at a company, especially when you look at the European space, you find that companies are really willing to hire in Rwanda or in the US they are willing to hire in Rwanda. But then each country has what I would call different data protection laws. Whereby, yes, you can hire people there, but then the 
not allowed to kind of access some of the data because they are limited to a specific right. region. Okay. Okay. And this is really problematic because I have the right skills, right? But then a specific organization is not willing to hire me unless I move to that place. So unless there, are, there is really a change in these policies, we'll continue uh, kind of having these uh, problems. But uh, some countries have started going in the right way. Uh, for example, if I tell you about Rwanda specifically, there is a new data and, uh, protection law that kind of aligns itself with what is uh, out there on the like global GDPR. scale. Yes, yes, yeah, like GDPR, kind of different from GDPR, but uh, like the same thing, right? So if countries go in this way, then uh, there is kind of set infrastructure, laws, policies that help people uh, be protected, not only both employers, employees, but also the goods that they are providing on a global scale, then it will be much and much easier. So you think that shift comes from only the country trying to get in, like Rwanda, the policy in Rwanda has to align itself to the policy in the, in the Global North countries? Or is there a push that needs to happen in the Global North countries, maybe also from the uh, international development community, mm -hmm. to say, hey, listen, you want to you know, you create jobs in, in these countries, let's, mm -hmm. you know, the countries that tick all the boxes in terms of governance. Mm -hmm. Let's uh, let's see if we can't uh, make make move towards them from our end. Or do you think that's that's a utopian to think that? I really, when when I look at some of these things in terms of policies and uh, in terms of uh, kind of laws that happen globally, right? Uh, people create policies and laws depending on what they've seen in their ecosystems, right? And I really understand that specific countries would like to go with their specific kind of structure, laws, policies. But if we were to sit down as countries, let's say we have the UN already, why can't we sit down and be like, we are seeing that the market or the globe is switching to mostly internet-based, I would say, things, services. Why can't we have something that uh, brings us all together in terms of policies that we all adapt to? then if there is need to change it or kind of adapt it to a specific country, you then take this as a reference, but then you have this kind of uh, changes that you can do. Then if it's something that is really necessary, you bring it to the table, then you share it together. Because when policies and laws are separate while the internet is global, right? I can access any website on the web, right? Mainly any not, maybe nearly all websites on the web, right? I can go there and create accounts. I can there and access a marketplace, Amazon, and things like that, why should I be limited, right, to the kind of uh, data protection laws that only apply there and not here? So if there is something that is universal, I think it would really help this market a lot. And not only us as developers, but on a global scale, not only us, but even other markets also. If you are talking about uh, someone that is in, into retail, right, they are processing people's data uh, in a specific country, right? But then when you want to expand, you have to go there, switch your server, switch your, I don't know, uh, server location, have, uh, have a look at uh, the kind of data you are processing, whether it's even allowed to process this kind of data there. So there are a lot of limitations, but if we were to sit down as a people, as the globe, and decide to go with one policy, I believe it will be hectic, right? But it's something that will be useful. Right. Yeah. Right. What about demand from the? You know, we, we, I don't know if we're moving towards a new Cold War with you know Russia and China. Mm -hmm. What about demand for coders from the other side? Is there, is there? What's the? Where's the demand for developers coming from? Is it only or is mostly like Western countries or is it also our Chinese um, and companies interested? I haven't really had a look deep into the Chinese uh, like You don't have anybody requests. in your friends mm, like no. who says, okay, I'm working for a, for a Chinese, Chinese company. company? No, no. Yeah. Mainly in Asia, it's most likely uh, Japan and Korea, right? South Korea. Uh, but China, not not that much. Okay, but there are Japanese and Korean companies that are... Mm, hiring in Africa, yes, mm -hmm. they're there. Right. And is that connected with like JICA, like the Japanese aid organizations, or is that most you... mostly are private companies? Okay, mostly are private companies that uh, decide to outsource their resources. Uh, I mean, their technology staff to other countries. Because when you look at the market, uh, 
there is really a shortage in software developers in that part of the world. Well, in any part of the world. Yeah, yeah in any part of the world. <laughs> yeah. And uh, also even in Rwanda, uh, yes, we are getting people, yes, we, are, we have a, a huge, I would say, talent pool, but there is still a shortage because you still have to train people. Uh, the market isn't that huge that uh, if we had big players coming in, uh, we wouldn't be affected. Yes, we would be affected, but then how do we create systems whereby people have their people now become not only developers, even other markets, right? But we create developers that are market ready. If you come out of school, yes, does it mean that you are job ready while you're coming out, out of school? That's a question mark. Then if you are not ready, what's out there for you? That's where these communities come in. That's where we have these incubation centers. That's where we have places like uh, K-Lab, uh, where people can go in as groups, learn new skills. Then we have different also developer programs uh, that out there that people can go through. We have a lot of resources that people can go through. So how do we kind of connect all these things so that we have uh, people that are market ready or we can even produce people or make people market ready in a specific period of time? Not only hiring senior developers, because then senior developers, to be honest, have options. If I've been uh, in a job for 10 years, then you're telling me, hire me, you're going to hire me, then uh, I will have to learn something new. They might be like, no. I'm already good where I am, you know. <laughs> but if, if you get people that uh, are young and are willing to learn new things on the market, you know, new technologies, and also software development is a, is a I would say, uh, software development is a career that requires you to be a quick learner and also to be open to learning new things as fast as they come. There are always new languages, new tools, updates every now and then. I think even if you're not a software developer with your laptop or phone always said you to update it. So that's something that developers are doing somewhere. <laughs> now, the tools they're using are always updated, so they have to learn. And it's mm -hmm. most likely that younger people are willing to do this kind, this kind of things other than senior people that have been in a workplace for a long period of time. All right. So speaking of having options, mm -hmm. uh, how, how hard is it to find developers here who are 100% committed, because you mentioned working on Upwork on the side, mm -hmm. right? That's a, that's that's lucrative, right? Yeah, yeah. If you ha once you once you have that skill level, mm -hmm. there's a lot of work for you yes, 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 through yes. different channels, mm -hmm. right? So that's what I've heard from others saying. Yes, well, yeah. it's hard getting a developer. You know, either they're not good or they're not concentrated because <laughs> they're doing their <laughs> they're, other thing. They're, they're doing other things. Uh, I think it's uh, it's more of uh, providing the right benefits environment for work, because. Um, if someone likes being a freelancer, then you don't want to move them from their freelancing world unless you're providing something better than that. Mm -hmm. Something that doesn't come with freelancing are this kind of uh, pension contribution unless they pay for themselves, medical insurance cover, a community, a workplace where you can go in and uh, you know sit down and do kind of work that you are doing. You don't have kind of uh, sick leave or leave days or insurance or life insurance and all these kind of things. So it's or, and. Obviously, yes, you are getting some money, but then if someone is kind of um, giving you a good offer and all these kind of benefits, are you willing to join them? So it's always a balance between providing the right environment and competition, you can't really uh, avoid it. Yeah. If uh, any other employer comes in Rwanda, right, and uh, they want to hire s someone, right, unless you provide something that is uh, better than what they were getting before, then yeah. They well, even if that at that level, they mm -hmm. don't even have to come to Rwanda. It's, uh, it's it, you're employed, but if your side hustle mm -hmm. is more lucrative, then you're going to spend more time there, and yes. you're going to slack off a bit on your work. But then, if your employer comes and kind of puts the gun to your chest and says, "Okay, you gotta, mm -hmm. you have to now produce here," and then you make the decision, some of them will say, "Well, okay, then I'm leaving." Yes. I'm, I'm a free. I'm a better freelancer, or the employer has to. So, so the um, kind of the upward mobility is already there, even mm -hmm. if you don't have that many companies that are doing it on the ground. Yes, because there's also Upwork and Fiverr and freelancer and you know yeah. Guru and. So there are pros and cons that comes with uh, opportunities being, I would say, open, right? For an employer, sometimes if you can't catch up with the market and how salaries are going or these benefits that are coming out there, if you can't catch up with them, then you would be left out, right? Uh, but also, if, if someone has better, I would say, offers or, I would say, uh, benefits, then they should be open because you shouldn't be kind of a prison whereby if someone is here, they should only be here. People should grow career-wise and uh, people should 
have open opportunities. If some, someone comes in, uh, uh, I don't know, Microsoft starts uh, an office uh, in Rwanda and decide to hire someone, if I can't give them, uh, I would say, uh, a better pay, better benefits, a better working environment, right? Because it's it, actually sometimes it's even less of pay and more of uh, the kind of teams you work on or the kind of products you are working yeah. on. Is it something that is really interesting? Right. So if you manage to adapt to these kind of things, then you are likely to win. But the market will always, competition will always be there and you can't uh, shy away from it. Right. Yeah. Well, it's exciting times. I, mm -hmm. I'm really... I'm really excited that when you say it's mostly private companies, mm -hmm. so it's really moving away from aid into private sector because it's making sense. It's not helping. It's uh, it's not it's not philanthropy. Yes, yes. It's really for-profit companies, you know, seeing a, seeing an edge in in, mm -hmm. in coming here and doing business here. So that, I'm setting up delivery locations. Mm -hmm. So we see that across the skill spectrum. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are more engaged in, well, I would say, less complex work than what you do, right? In, you know, contact center work. Yeah. Um, but across the, all these sectors, is it's really interesting how Sub-Saharan Africa is really, uh, I mean, it's been long enough. You know, it's time. <laughs> it's and, time. And it's, it's time. really fun to be part of this, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's, really, it's really great when, uh, You've seen the ecosystem grow, whereby we had uh, people, most of the developers were hired by government institutions, and the ambition was uh, really mostly working for a non-profit or a government institution. Then there is a boom into the private sector locally. Then after that, now there is a boom into international organizations or companies coming in Rwanda, hiring the talent. So when you see this kind of growth, you are like, really there is no limit to what people can do, no matter where they are based. Uh, or their locality is, in a way. Okay. Yeah. So if a new company wants to come into Kigali, uh, Jacques from Objectivity, Objectivity mm. is mm. In, in at Norskin. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. Stop by, right? Um, mm. Say hi. Say hi, <laughs> and uh, and meet the ecosystem, right? Meet, 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 meet the, the people and meet, meet meet people like yourself. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. Well, thanks. Thank you for your time and the invitation. Uh, this was really great. Great. Mm. Thanks. Thank you.